your source for everything paranormal, Parapex. History has been altered by word of mouth and the misrepresentation of those who might not have been present when some of the world's most significant events took place. Channelers Barry and Connie Strom bring through the spirits of those who actually witnessed or took part in these historical events and lets them tell their stories in their own words. Welcome to Channeling History, and now, here are your hosts, Barry and Connie Strong. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to Channeling History. We're the only show where we speak to guests that are no longer with us and are on the other side. And we are brought to you on Sundays by the Para-X Radio Network. I'm Barry Strom, your host, and I'll be doing the channeling tonight. Now, if those of you that have been listening to us before realize, we usually start out with a small disclaimer. And we usually have no idea how the spirit guests will answer the questions or give opinions. Now, tonight, the disclaimer is going to be especially appropriate because our guest is John Wilkes Booth. And he had some really strong opinions in life, especially about slavery and Abraham Lincoln. So the opinions or statements voiced on our show are the channeled words of the spirits or angels and do not necessarily reflect our opinions, those of the Parax Network, or any of our sponsors. I'm Connie Strom, your co-host, and I would like to thank you for tuning in to our show tonight. As Barry mentioned, our guest tonight was responsible for one of the most notorious assassinations in our country's history, the killing of Abraham Lincoln. Tonight, we'll be asking him some very pointed questions. We hope that those of you in the chat room will give us some questions as well. Our show is very different in that all of our guests are on the other side. So far, we have interviewed famous individuals such as Elvis, President Kennedy, Princess Diana. Last week, we interviewed the Archangel Azrael. All of our shows are available for download on Podomatic or listen to on your our YouTube channel in the name of Barry Strom. Uh, we would really appreciate if you submit your questions to us through the chat room because we like to know what's on your mind. Uh, we do have a list of prepared questions but prefer to use those that you put forward. When Barry channels tonight he will be speaking the words of John Wilkes Booth. They are definitely not his words, so if you do not like what you hear, please do not blame the messenger. When he channels, he remembers very little of what he says. He will make an occasional mistake at channeling. It is not an exact science. In the future, we're going to be doing a bunch of special shows. On December the 20th, for Christmas, we're going to bring you Mother Mary, and she will join us and tell us the truth about the birth of Jesus. If any of you have read my book, Spirit Speak, Channeling the Life of Jesus, you know that I devoted an entire chapter to his birth. Uh, you're going to find that her explanation of the events surrounding his birth are going to vary somewhat from what is written in the Gospels. But you're going to realize that her words are going to make the events even more, more believable for you. Uh, in our future shows, we'd like to interview spirits as recommended by our listeners. Please suggest your, submit, your suggestions for future shows or questions for our guest tonight. Oh, well, not tonight. It's too late, obviously. But if you would uh, have recommendations for next week's guest, send them to our email, 
which is channelinghistoryonparax at gmail.com, and that's channelinghistoryonparax at gmail.com. Now tonight is going to be a very interesting show. You're going to have the opportunity to submit questions to the soul or spirit of the person that killed President Lincoln. Now, while we do have questions prepared for Mr. Booth, we welcome your participation through the chat room. I see that we've got quite a few people there, so I'm hoping that you do respond and ask them. Now, last week, we interviewed the Archangel Azrael, who's known as the Angel of Death, and he gave us a wonderful show. That show is available on Podomatic. You can download it and listen to it, or it's on my YouTube channel. Now, Azrael is known as the Angel of Death because he assists souls in passing into heaven. He spoke of the role of angels in general and some of his other, other roles. I highly recommend that you would listen to this because death is something we're all going to have to face, and it's not something that should be feared. So it was a great show. I hope that some of you will take the time to go back and listen to it. Okay, as Barry said, I believe all of our previous shows are available on our YouTube channel, and that's in Barry Strom's name. Um, when we begin our channeling tonight, I will ask the questions, and Barry will answer the questions in the words of John Wilkes Booth. Barry devoted a chapter in his book, Spirits Speak of Conspiracies and Mysteries, and tonight you will hear that, the true story, which is not written in the history books. We're going to correct history tonight, where Mr. Booth is. In the future, we plan to bring you more very interesting historic figures and archangels. We will speak with Gabriel, Michael, and Metatron, as well as others. If you've listened to our show, you know that before we channel, we always say a prayer of protection. There is definitely evil out there, and once we open a channel, we want to make sure that we're protected, as well as listeners can uh, use a little protection themselves. So Connie will now say the prayer, and then we'll get on with our channeling with Mr. Booth. God, please grant us your wisdom and protection. Grant us the knowledge that we can handle and keep us safe from all things that will harm us. Keep the messages positive and pure love. Keep us safe from our own ego. We ask these things in the light of the seen, the unseen, and the honesty of God. Amen. Okay, Mr. Booth, would you like to begin with a message for our listeners? Yes. I was actually quite shocked that, I was, that the guides came and asked me to come and, ans and answer questions for you tonight. It has been a long time since I committed the crime of killing President Lincoln. Things were much different then and there was much hatred around. Sadly, I let myself be influenced by the terrible hatred and committed a crime that I found out was the worst thing that could have taken place for the South. After I killed Lincoln, the politicians took it out on the people, and Reconstruction was a terrible thing for the, for the people that I loved in the South. I know that I did wrong, and I can tell from your questions that I will be answering that we will discuss many of the points. I wish that I had the decision that I made to do over, but sadly, I don't. So, anyway, here I am. I hope that people will learn a lesson from what I did and understand that hatred is a terrible thing and it can destroy not only the life that you are living, but have a huge influence on when your soul arrives back on the other side and 
when the soul wishes to return, it will also have a huge influence on the karma of that future life. Okay, when you arrived in heaven, what happened? When I, was, when I arrived in heaven, I was met by my guides. And they were very pointed in telling me that I had done a terrible thing. By the time I arrived in heaven, I understood that what I did was very wrong. They informed me that I would be sent to a lower level, to a lower realm in heaven, where I would have to contemplate what I did and understand the terrible harm that I had caused. I was sent to, the, to that level, and it was not until tonight that I've been allowed to come back and actually discuss things with other individuals. Okay, which level were you sent to? There's seven levels. I was sent to the first level. It is not a good place to be. There are many souls there that have created harm to others and have done a lot of evil in their incarnate lives. It is a place of loneliness and it is a place where you are not allowed to talk to your family members that have been deceased and you are counseled by your spirit guides and you spend an immense amount of time feeling regret for the way that you wasted your incarnate life. It is possible, as I did, that stupid decisions can ruin many good lives. When I had been home before, I was on a good level and realized just how great it was and sadly when I returned I allowed hatred to take over my body and my mind and I did terrible things. What will your future karma be? That is something that we discuss with the guides. They are telling me of the possibility that I can do a life plan and return in the relatively near future. I do know that that plan will incorporate me having to help many other people. Many of the souls that I harmed have been have returned in lives and I will actually have to seek out those souls and do kind things for them. So the details are not complete, but I do know that I will have to dedicate many future lives to serving the souls that are currently living lifetimes. Okay, could you tell us about your family? My family, I actually had a, had a very good family. I was raised in Maryland, and it was a very difficult time to grow up. I knew that the country was being torn apart. The southern states felt that they had the right to live their lives and to possess slaves to help them in their work and many viewed slaves as as the property to be purchased and sold. My, My brother was also an actor. I was very close to him until 
war broke out because he felt that the abolition of slavery was the thing to do, was the proper thing to do. And I felt that the rights of the southern states were to be preserved. So I was, I cannot blame anything on my family. I made the decisions myself and I felt that that my free will was most important. Okay, what was your opinion of slavery at the time? In the South, slavery was an established institution. The large plantations that grew cotton could not have existed without the existence of slave labor. It had always been a way of life in the South, and many of the institutions depended upon it. The citizens of the southern states also felt very strongly about the concept of states' rights. Slavery was quietly tearing the country apart for years. As people moved to the West, they wanted to utilize slaves to help them work the properties. The abolitionists in the North wanted to stop the spreading of slavery. Now that I'm over here, I fully understand just how bad the concept of slavery was. I have actually met many souls that lived in slavery. It was a terrible institution. But at the time, you have to understand that it was very commonplace. After all, many of the founding fathers owned slaves. They, the fathers such as Jefferson and Washington owned many slaves and re relied upon them to maintain their huge properties. So while there were many people that wanted to do away with it, there were also many important people that depended upon it. So slavery, even though in the eyes of history was a terrible thing, it was the mechanism that allowed much of the prosperity of the South to exist. Yeah. What was your opinion of Lincoln? Lincoln was the personification of an abolitionist. And since I felt so strongly that slavery should exist, I also felt very strongly that having Lincoln elected as president would assure the end of the institution of slavery in the South. So, yes, I truly hated him at the time. I know now that such a hatred was a terrible thing, and I know the consequences of my actions. Were you hired to kill Abe Lincoln? Yes. Were you paid money to kill Lincoln? I was promised that I would be able to maintain the money that I had acquired as an actor and that I would be kept safe 
and protect it. I felt that if I killed Lincoln, that the people of the South would look at it as a blessing and that I would be welcomed into the Southern states and would be protected there. Okay, who contacted you about this? I was contacted by an agent from the highest level of the Northern government. I was told that there were very important people in the cabinet that served Lincoln that wanted him removed. They wanted him out of office because they felt that he would be too soft on Reconstruction and on this, and what was to take place to rebuild the South. There were also those in the cabinet that wanted the power of being president. So I was told that if I recruited others and could figure out how to assassinate the president, that I would be given a large sum of money and would be protected from prosecution. Okay, we started getting some questions from our chat room, so here we go. The first question is, was the landlady that you rented the room from part of the conspiracy or just a victim of circumstances? Are you, if you are referring to Mary Surratt, she sympathized with what we were doing. When I was living, as we approached the time of the assassination, and I was living in a boarding house, that woman knew nothing of what we were doing. But Mary Surratt did truly know of our plans and stored weapons for us so that we would be able to escape. Okay, question number two. Mr. Booth, you did not get caught when it was said and allegedly you allegedly lived in Granbury, Texas for a while, but were your final days spent in Eden, Oklahoma under the name of David E. George? It's also been alleged that you confessed of your true identity before a priest before your passing. Much of that is true, and I am going to be going into greater detail in the future. But it is true that I was not killed in Virginia. Okay, our next question is, was Lincoln the only person that you killed in your lifetime? Yes. I did not kill anyone else. It was an act of passion at the time. And President Lincoln was the only individual that I ever killed. Okay, were you aware of who was behind the plot? I was told that the highest of political powers were behind the plot. I was told that there were some members of the cabinet that would be taking over and would have control and would protect me. I was never given the specific name, but they were very clear who the individual was. I was never told that if the Secretary of War was specifically involved, and I was never told that the Vice President was specifically involved. But it was insinuated by the individual that talked to me. Okay, we have another question from the chat room. Have you ever seen Lincoln since you left the lower level? No, I have not. Mr. Lincoln resides on much higher levels, and I was sent to the lower level. 
So since I was not allowed out of that level, and since the president never came down to visit me, I have never seen him. Okay. Uh, were you originally going to try to kidnap him? We had talked of trying to kidnap him. But we realized that it was going to be impossible. And the individual that was recruiting me informed me that he would be very vulnerable when he attended Ford's Theater on that night. So we had talked of it, but it was never anything that we could have pulled off. Why was there no security for the president at Ford's Theater that evening? One, an individual, took the security guard to, the, to a bar across the street and assured him that all would be well with the president. So that was part of the diversion. That was actually done by an agent of the people that hired us to do the assassination. Did you break your leg when you leaped to the floor at Ford's Theater? When I leaped to the floor, I sprained my ankle. It was not until later that, while I was trying to escape, that my horse actually fell and I broke my leg in the fall. So yes, I did injure my leg at Ford's Theater when I jumped from the box, but I did not break it until later when I had an accident with my horse. Why was Vice President Johnson never attacked? There was a story that President Johnson was to be killed. However, Vice President Johnson was part of the conspiracy. He was one of the main people that was behind the assassination. So a story was prepared that he was actually a target of the assassination and that was used as a diversionary tactic so that he would not be suspected as being involved. So how did you ever escape out of Washington DC after that? The Secretary of the Army of the military was part of the plan. He arranged that the bridges out of DC would be guarded, but that there would be a bridge from which we could escape. So it was the Secretary of the Army that actually laid the plans, though, so that I would be able to get out of town. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, why, you... don't, why don't we take a break here? It's uh, time. Let's listen to a, a few little messages, and then we will return. Don't go away. Channeling history will return right after these brief messages. You've no doubt heard of Tango and Cash, Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. Perhaps it takes two to tango. Well, now, on the first and third Thursdays of each month, there's a show called Tango and Friends at 8 p.m. Eastern on the Para-X Radio Network with your host, Bruce Tango. And yes, there will be at least two to tango on each episode, sometimes even more. There's going to be lots of topics and lots of guests you'll all know and lots of surprises. Prizes. Tango and Friends, every first and third Thursday of the month at 8 p.m. right here on the Para-X Radio Network. I am Oz, the great and powerful. Who are you? I, if you please, I, I'm Dorothy, the small and me. I've come to ask you... Silence! The great and powerful Oz knows why you have come. Step forward, whippersnappers! 
Bring me the broomstick of a witch. Marla's broom? But, 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 but if we do that, we'll have to k- kill her to get it. Bring me her broomstick, and I'll grant your request. Now go. But what if she kills us first? I said go. What's that? What's that? It's Marla's castle guard. And look, there's her broom right in front of the gate. Go get it. All right. I'll go in there, witch or no witch. Guards or no guards. I'll tear them apart. Oh, no, you won't. Don't think of leaving. My little party's just beginning. I always stir my cauldron Thursday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern on the Para-X Radio Network. Now back off from that broom or I'll turn you into Toto's chew toy. I do believe in witches. I do, I do, I do. Have you ever wondered what Jesus and his followers would say if you could receive their messages today? In his new book, Spirits Speak, Channeling Jesus and the Holy Spirits, channeler and author Barry Strom answers those questions for you. Using his gift of spirit communication, he brings you messages from such Holy Spirits as Moses, John the Baptist, Mary Magdalene, Mother Mary, Jesus, and even Mother Teresa and the Reverend Billy Graham. They discuss topics that are important for contemporary life in these troubled times. Spirits Speak, Channeling Jesus and the Holy Spirits is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and other booksellers. Signed copies are available on the author's website, spiritspredict.com. After reading this book, you will never again say, What would Jesus say or do? Era X Radio. Welcome back to Channeling History. Now, here are your hosts, Barry and Connie Strom. Okay, welcome back. Uh, We're going to get on with our little channeling going on here. Uh, Mr. Booth has been very cooperative, and we have a bunch more questions to ask of him. So, Connie, what is our next question? Okay, uh, what role did Mary Surratt play in the assassination other than storing your arms for you? She allowed us to use her house. Uh, we met there, and that's where we made our plans for the assassination. She knew exactly what we were going to be doing. So even though many believed that hanging was a bit severe for her punishment, she was actually part of the conspiracy. She did allow us to hide weapons in her home, and she allowed us to meet, and we spoke freely in front of her. So there was no doubt in her mind what we were about to do. So that's why she was hung? Well, part of the reason she was hung was to keep her quiet, because she would have heard about us talking about the important people that were behind hiring us to carry out the plot. Okay. Um, why were the others hung? For the same reason. They were, they were party to the information. They knew that there were very important people involved and that the only way to keep them quiet was to kill them. So that is why everyone was hung. Dr. Mudd and others were pardoned. Why were they pardoned? Dr. Mudd was innocent. We came to him to fix my leg, and he did not truly realize who I was or what I had done because the word had not gotten to him. So he was innocent, just the same as some of the others that were sent to prison. While... Before the assassination, others, minor players, were assured that they would be protected. So when they were put into prison, they were told that there would be a time 
that they would be pardoned, and if they kept their mouths shut, all would be well for them. So when Vice President Johnson became president, they were in prison and they were released before he went out of office. That was how their silence was assured. Okay, we have another interesting question from the chat room. It says, do you think the Confederate flag represents hate? Do you think it should be banned in the South because it's offense to some people? No. The Confederate flag, and there were many different Confederate flags, the Confederate flag was a symbol of the southern states. There were people that fought and died to protect that flag and to protect the southern way of life. Keep in mind that most of the people that were killed on the side of the South never owned slaves. They were poor people. They were farmers. But they felt strongly that the South should have their individual, should have their state's rights preserved. So the symbol of the flag was not, is not a symbol of hatred. It is a flag that many thousands of people loved and fought to preserve. So just as times change through the years, the opinions should change as well. Today, people are looking for excuses to show hatred. And the Confederate flag has become one of those objects. But just as many things change through time, so has the concept of the Confederate flag. Okay, um, was the Confederate Secret Service involved in the plot to kill Lincoln? We had discussed this with the Secret Service. I met with them in Canada and they decided that it was too risky to become involved. And we knew that there was going to be nothing they could do to help us. So when we were approached by the representative of the cabinet members, we felt that we could be secure in our plan and that we would be protected. Yeah. Okay, we have another quick question from the chat room. Was Lucy Hale your secret fiance? Yes, I knew Lucy and I did care deeply for her. So there, she was a secret fiance. We were intending to marry, but then when I became involved with the plot, I knew that that could never happen. Yes. Okay, back to your escape. Who was killed in Virginia? The Army had captured a Confederate captain, and he strongly resembled me. They took him to Virginia and killed him and said that that was my body. At the time it took place, I was actually many miles away. Okay. David Harrod surrendered at the farm. Why did he not say that they killed the wrong person? They, David was assured that he would be protected if he lied about this. This was going to be part of the overall plan. David felt that if he, he, well, he was told that if he surrendered at the farm, that he would not be killed and that he would be protected in the long run and that he might serve a little bit of prison time, but that he would be released and all would be well. Okay. Uh, there are a lot of people identified the dead body as yours. How was that arranged? 
There were many people paid off. They had, there were, as I said, these were the most powerful people in the country that were doing this. David was told that he would be protected. Many people were told that if they identified the dead body, that they would be given positions of power or would be paid off. There were actually no pictures taken of the autopsy, which is very strange because had pictures been taken, people would have known that it was not my body. Okay. Okay, getting back to David Harold, uh, why didn't he say that they killed the wrong person? As I said before, he had been promised safety and that he would be protected. What happened was they hung him to keep him quiet. He never thought that that was going to happen, or he certainly would have told the truth of the events. But once David was put on trial and hung very rapidly, obviously there was nothing he could do. Yeah. Okay, back to our chat room. Uh, I think you might have answered this before, but how did you feel about yourself after you assassinated the president? Immediately after I assassinated the president, I felt that I had done a great thing for the South. I felt that by killing the president, that it would put the government into turmoil and that our army, uh, at the time, General Johnson was still fighting, and I felt that, we, that it would give our army a great advantage. I did not realize that Johnson had actually surrendered prior to me killing Lincoln. Okay, another question from our chat. You are from a family of famous actors who subsequently returned to England. Did you have any contact with your family after the shooting? And did you ever return to acting? No. There was no way I could return to acting. I was too well known. And I cut off all contact with my family for fear that they would be drug into the that they would be drug into the uh, into the legal actions that were taking place and that there was a possibility that they might even be assassinated themselves. Okay. Where were you when the incident at the farm occurred? I was actually further south in Virginia, and I was on my escape route. I was headed to attempt to get to Kentucky. Okay, Is that that's where you were headed then afterwards? It said after you were supposedly killed, where would you go? You went to Kentucky? That was where I, I headed for Kentucky. There was a remote area where I felt that I could live, and it was still full of Southern sympathy, so I felt that that was a logical place for me. Yeah. What name did you assume when you were down there? I assumed the name of John St. Helens. I figured that was as far as I could get from the name John Wilkes Booth. Okay. So did you marry while you were there? Yes. I actually met a woman, and we married, and I tried to live with her for a period of time. Okay. Did you sign the marriage license with your true name? Yes. I actually signed J.W. Booth on a marriage license in Kentucky. So why did you leave your wife? She had an older son, and he started to suspect who I was. And I felt that he would tell the officials and that I would have to 
<clears throat> and that they would bring scrutiny upon me. So I felt it was best that I abandon her and headed west. Okay, so you went west after. Can we ask where out west? I headed for I headed for Texas. There was still Texas at that time was still the frontier, and I felt that I could lose myself in that state and and live a fairly normal life. I actually bought a bar and tried to and tried to earn a living through that bar. Okay. Why did you leave that town? There was a woman in the town that was going to marry a U.S. Marshal. And he was to arrive in town for the wedding. I feared that he would recognize me. So I left and went further west in Texas. Okay. What did you do when you arrived at that destination? I tried to work at odd jobs. I did some painting, uh, did some different things. The, I found out that it was very hard to make a living when you were trying to keep the world from knowing who you were. Okay, and how long did you live there? I lived there probably for 10 years. Okay, and why did you leave there? Well, I became ill. And I was very sure that I was going to die. So I actually confessed that I was John Wilkes Booth because I felt that I was on my deathbed and that I was going to pass from the earth. So I confessed. What happened was I didn't die and I lived. So as soon as I regained my health, I fled from the Texas frontier and headed for Oklahoma. Okay, and what name did you assume when you were in Oklahoma? I actually assumed a couple different names in Oklahoma. I, I did, while I did wind up in Enid, I lived in other towns. So I was afraid that, once again, my fame would catch up with me. Okay, and what was your occupation in Oklahoma? I painted houses. I did handyman work. And sadly, I succumbed to alcoholism. And I found that it would be, I was trying to bury my memories and all the sadness that I had caused by drinking and I also had access to some drugs at the time. Okay, back to the chat room. Did you ever have any interest in revisiting Ford's Theater now that you, since you've been on the other side? No. I'm since I'm in that one of the lower levels where I'm not allowed to travel freely. I would not be allowed to go, but I really have no desire to return to where I ruined my life and the life of so many others. Yeah. Okay, and another question is, were you really jealous of your brother's fame, and did that contribute to your need to participate in the assassination plot? No. I always thought that I was the best actor in the family. I, modesty was never my problem. I did not. I knew my brother was a good actor as well, but really, we may have had inner family jokes about me being jealous of him, but in reality, I always knew I was the better actor. Okay, more from the chat room. 
that it seems there were so many people involved in this assassination. How is it that no information leaked out at the time? It's kind of... Well, they were very, very important people. And they did a good job of planning. When I, when we killed the president, we fled, and the military captured many of my co-conspirators. The stories were so strong that were made up that no one ever suspected that anyone other than myself had done the plan and done the deed. These, at the time, when Lincoln was killed, the grief that the nation underwent was so intense that the, his funeral procession and grief took much of the attention of the country. All attention was directed towards capturing myself and David because we were the ones that had escaped for the longest period of time. The newspapers of the time only associated me and my co-conspirators with the crime. They never investigated any of the other individuals. It was a very difficult time in the history of the country. So it was a very easy time to put out stories that were false. And because of the rapid trial and hanging, the store and the everyone believed that I had been killed. So it pretty much brought an end to any speculation it could have because it could have been active. I fled to the south, so there were no ways of knowing that I was still alive. Okay, and our last question. Who met you when you died and crossed over? I was met by my guides. They did not allow any of my family members to be present, and they escorted me to the low level. So it was not like a passing of a normal individual that had lived a good life. Okay, in what year did you pass? I actually did not pass until 1903, and that took place in the town of Eden, Oklahoma. And what was the cause of your death? I actually committed suicide. I overdosed intentionally because I just simply could not face what was taking place in my life any longer. Okay, and when you passed, what happened to your body? Well, nobody claimed my body. So when I'd been in, in Kentucky, I had gotten the attention of an attorney. And somehow or other, he found out that I had passed. So he came to Oklahoma and claimed my body and had it mummified. And actually exhibited my body at different carnivals and I was even at the 19 I was even exhibited at the 1904 World's Fair okay um, do you know where your body is now my body was actually last shown in public in the 1970s in the state of Pennsylvania. What, at that point, the 
carnival who owned my body was going out of business and simply buried it in a landfill. So I guess that is a fitting end to my story. Okay. Mr. Boothby, thank you so much for your honesty. Um, do you have a final message for us? Yes. I would like to tell people not to be overcome by hatred. Hatred ruined my life. Hatred destroyed any possibility I had of enjoying my finances that I'd accumulated acting or of enjoying the fame that I would have had as an actor. Do not get caught up in the hatred of the moment. You will find that the long-term consequences are not worth it. So thank you for listening to me tonight. Thank you for hearing my story. And I hope that you will follow my advice and not let hatred destroy a good life because I can assure you there are many consequences. That's a very important message for a lot of people today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Booth, for coming through for us. You can submit questions or recommendations for future, future shows through our email, Challenging History, on parax at gmail.com. My new book, Spirit Speak, Challenging Jesus and the Holy Spirit, is now available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, wherever books are sold. And this book is now available for, on Kindle for immediate download. If you want a signed copy, they're only available through my website, spiritspredict.com or wordsofgodthenandnow.com. Christmas season is a great time to give my books as they represent the words of our Lord. Next week, we're going to do something a little different, and we're going to be chatting with Cleopatra. She will be telling us of her life and what really took place in those early days. So I hope you enjoyed the show. I thank you for listening. Please join us on Sundays at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on the Para-X Radio Network. Thank you so much. I look forward to speaking with you again next Sunday. In the meantime, God bless you all. Thanks for listening to Channeling History. Tune in again next week for another electrifying episode as we never know who will make an appearance or who will come through the portal. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2020. Our story begins by Kevin McLeod, licensed through Incompetech.com.